Good afternoon. Good afternoon, friends and newcomers to the South Orange Library Summer Lecture Series Special Conference with the Special People, Phyllis Calvin. I'm so happy to introduce our guest today, Siri Putzbeck, who is indeed very special. She's an author who has written seven novels, two books of essays, several on non of nonfiction, a lecturer of psychiatry at the Wild Medical School at Cornell. Her accomplishments are too many to list in an hour. So she lectures all over the world. So we are so fortunate that she has agreed to speak here today. I appreciate it very much and will too. This topic is the one I think will help everyone who hears it. It is writing for your health. Um, in the library, I, I run a creative writing class for years. And it's, the people are so expressive with one another because we can trust one another and we, it's almost, so writing is healthy, uh, but I want to know all the reasons why. So I can't, <laughs> <Okay. laughs> it gives me great pleasure to introduce you, Siri. But before I do, I would like to introduce my wonderful moderator, Laura Sims. <laughs> she's author and she's an author of a fabulous book, Looker, and Reference librarian who also was a moderator for Paul Oster. I think you know him. He's your husband. And he a few months ago, <laughs> he spoke here. He was wonderful. And the fact that the two of you are so lovely, I wish I lived in Brooklyn so I could say hello to you in person. But in any case, please now, I'm going to give the, um, the mic to you and, and all the information. Thank you, Laura, so much. Thank you. Hi, Laura. Very high tech here. <laughs> Very Hi, high tech. Siri. <laughs> Great to see you. Um, thank you so much for coming today. I mean, coming, you know, virtually. Yes. Um, really happy to have you here. And I'm such a fan of your novels. So it was really great for me to get a chance to become more familiar with your nonfiction, uh, like the essays in this book. A this is one of my favorite titles. I love this. A woman <laughs> looking at men, looking at women. Essays on art, sex, and the mind. And um, we can't do the whole book, of course, because we... <laughs> That would take a while, but we are going to focus on one of the essays that you wrote called The Writing Self and the Psychiatric Patient, uh, which has a lot about the relationship between writing and mental health. Um, specifically, it's about the time you spent volunteering at Payne Whitney in New York as a volunteer writing instructor for psychiatric inmates. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about you know, how you got started doing that, how long yeah. you were, things like that. So, so in a way, um, that um, job, uh, volunteer job, uh, combined a couple of my interests. I had been um, reading and researching for years and years in the related fields of uh, psychiatry, neurology, um, and neuroscience. But one thing I did not, have any experience with is clinical experience with patients. And mm -hmm. I was setting out to write a novel um, called The Sorrows of an American, narrated by a psychiatrist. And so I thought, how can I write this book if I really don't have living experience with patients? Mm. Now, it is not so easy to get into a hospital. And I have many friends who are psychiatrists and I said, I asked one of them, you know, was this possible? And he said, you know, Siri, you could volunteer as a teacher. Right. And okay. he really helped me uh, get the job at Wild Cornell at Payne Whitney. I uh, simply went in there and learned as I went along. I have to say it was probably one of the most important learning experiences of my life. Wow. Wow. That's because great. you you start to understand things. I think that was also when I began to feel that writing really had therapeutic uses. Right. Right. And how long did you do the job for? Four years. 
I year. actually, I finished, I finished the novel <laughs> and I, I kept teaching. It wow. was extremely, extremely um, interesting and very enlivening. Um, you know, there was a certain kind of dread because the patients change very often. Sometimes I would have a patient that came four times in a row. Other times they disappear. People right. do not stay in the hospital so long. These are not asylums. Uh, right. They're often leave. And the stories the patients had to tell were often heartbreaking. I'm sure. I'm sure. And, um, and you know, they had all kinds of different mental illnesses. Right. Um, because I had studied psychiatry for so long, I found myself diagnosing them. Oh, you know, that person has this, that person has that. And then I really just stopped because I realized that one of the really good aspects of going to a writing class as a patient was that you were not followed by your diagnosis. Right. You we're not boxed in by that diagnosis. You were a human being writing right. with other human beings in a class. And that in itself um, could take you out of the immediate drama of your psychiatric treatment. Right, right. So given that context you were in, how did you, I'm sure it was different than teaching just any other creative writing workshop, right? Yeah, yeah, now well, I teach doctors. You know, I have an appointment at the same institution and okay. I get the seminar in narrative psychiatry for uh, psychiatric residents. So they're mostly young doctors in their thirties. Yeah. Um, it's a completely different experience. I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah. So when you were designing the workshop, how was it different? You know, what were your goals for the students? And well, this is it. What I found out um, was that some I usually did poems because they're short. I would ask, I would bring in a poem and then ask the patients to respond to the poem in any way they wanted. Okay. And they would do it with a kind of automatic writing. I would just say, whatever comes to you, just let it out, do it. Right, right. And, uh, and some poems, it turns out, work much better than others. Mm. But it's not necessarily what you think, right? right? So Emily Dickinson is a difficult poet, mm -hmm. right? And nevertheless, Dickinson was a winner. Wow. <laughs> She Gets went it. over fine. really Gets big time. Wallace Stevens, another great American poet that I happen to love, was not a success. Oh, not a success. Not okay. a success. And I started to think of what this was about. Yeah. And I think that Stevens was often not emotional enough That's Mm -hmm. trigger the kinds of responses that that really hit these you know, yes these very heady yeah He's very heady and yeah. and I realized that so Stevens was a bum <laughs> but there there's another um more obscure book that I really love by um an artist poet named Joe Brainerd and he wrote an entire book and every line starts with, I remember. I love that book. It's a wonderful book. I've I, used like, what, I mean, one of my favorite I remembers is he says, I remember that life was just as serious then as it is now. Wow. Talking about its childhood, you know. Hey, right. And then That's there are other very simple things. The, the patients, and I dare say many other people. Yeah. I love this I remember assignment. And whenever I was stuck, you know, and enough time had gone by, so I wasn't going to have the same students, you know. I would pull out, I remember, and it was inevitably a success. Right. Yeah. I still have, I still have you know, sometimes they didn't have to give me their work, but if they wanted mm -hmm. to, the patients could. So I still have a whole stack of patient writing. Yeah. Some of it extremely moving and some of it extremely original. Right. And, um, and linguistically dynamic. Wow. That's yeah. fascinating. It was yeah, I, 
I've, I've used that book to teach for many years too. And I find it, it really focuses people on like the moment, you know, it's almost like haiku it, and details. That's so right. I think, and I think you know, I started thinking about this from a scientific point of view, what you have there is a kind of machinery of memory. It gets yeah. people going. One mm -hmm. thing then gets associated to the next and, um, and, you know, material that you had totally forgotten resurfaces. Right. right. Um, so it, as an exercise for people to do, I think it's really uh, fascinating. Yeah. That's very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. So with those students, you weren't necessarily like working on their writing per se, like at the <laughs> center level, right? Yeah. No, it was really, and, and that relates to something that I also mention in the, in the essay that, that yeah. you brought up, uh, the writing self and the psychiatric patient, is that there really is a lot of uh, empirical evidence. Um, a good deal of it has been done by a man named Pennebaker, mm. and he has really demonstrated that 20 minutes of emotionally charged hmm. writing every day has positive effects on the immune system, on mood, also on liver function. Wow. Um, so that is a fascinating thing. Now, the problem is not the empirical research. The problem is how to frame this, you know, what is happening, right? What is it? that is happening. And that and, seems like the focus of this essay too, is like, why, right. why, why is, it? is it? Why is it? So people have a tendency because most of us are locked into a sort of mind body divide. So we think about writing as a kind of mental activity. And mm -hmm. of course it's not, there is no, you know, mind body separation. There is something we think about as the mind, but of course it's deeply connected to our whole bodily self in our physiology right so which is complex and one of my uh sort of among the papers i've written that are you know the the scientific papers uh have been trying to create a, the a nice theoretic model for why this works um thinking about um bodily rhythms but also about um expression. I think you mentioned, you sent me some questions in advance about the movement from some kind of internal mm -hmm. sense into right. the outside. So right. what I found was when the patients wrote, this is even, I think, more dramatic than when you're talking, mm -hmm. right? We talk yeah. and then um, we're getting something out of us. We're trying to express what we mean. Right. Uh, but when you write, there's a greater fixity to it. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I say I, I'm already symbolizing myself in language for someone else's benefit to understand. Mm -hmm. Just as you right. say I, right? And then, but that can switch. Your I and I'm I, but you're mm -hmm. you, <laughs> you're you for me, <laughs> and I'm you for you, for you. Right. right. So um, once you've gotten something outside into that symbolic realm, um, that's. I think already an act that is part of the social world, right? It's part of, right. of us, not just me. Right. And when you write that I is even more fixed because it's stuck on the page there. And mm -hmm. I noticed that the patients sometimes had this wonderful response to what they had, you know, I remember this or that sometimes very mm -hmm. sad terrible right. things, you know, right. um, but that was then shared with the whole group that you do to mm -hmm. the classes. Yeah. And the externalization seemed to have tremendous benefits. Right. And I think you mentioned in your essay that that's true for writers, even people writing in their journal, right? Because Absolutely. even you're if still... you're the only consumer, 
<laughs> right. <laughs> right. You're still writing to yourself as an other, right? You're writing to yourself as an other. Yeah. And that sure. allows you a certain kind of distance. It's mm. what I called in that essay, the alien familiar, right? So it's, it's you, it's somehow right. part of you, but it's also been alienated onto the page. It allows you to look at that outside eye mm -hmm. with some discrimination and distance. Right, right. And I think that's, um, that's in itself a, has a therapeutic benefit, not just for psychiatric patients, but for all of us. Right, yeah. That's such a fascinating, I, I love that. I, I was wondering if you could talk a little about, because that seems like a really interesting kind of a newer idea about why writing is therapeutic. You know, we hear that all the time. What are some of the reasons that you find not as helpful for writing being therapeutic? That what people, mean, what, people, mean, what, what, what people think is therapeutic or what is just anti-therapeutic in writing? I know what people think, sorry, what people think is therapeutic about writing, which may not be as therapeutic. Right. Well, I, I think, um, you know, there's something um, that it's kind of a beautiful word that psychology has ruined called rumination, that uh -huh. when people um, get have kind of obsessive thoughts, Right. You know, I'm so ugly or no one likes me. And this becomes a kind of internal mantra. Right. So if you're simply externalizing an internal mantra, <laughs> right. It, right. it's not going to help you. That's Just as, you know, it's it, all writing is not therapeutic. I mean, if you're copying a recipe, that's a practical thing to right. do, right. but it's not going to improve your liver function, right? Right, right. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a practical act. Um, right. So I think, you know, the key part of the empirical work is that it's, emotionally driven so something right. is happening between the inside and the outside and that can have therapeutic value right um, also it's interesting in writing groups and, and this has to be acknowledged you're part of a shared collective mm -hmm. and i did come to believe that that in itself had value right yeah. that that you, you know, I, this can happen, I think, one on one, too, in a kind of dialogical situation that's just two people involved. But in the group, I think having all the eyes of the other people on the work that a patient had done was right. a kind of validation in itself. Right. Um, especially for people who are in the hospital and, yeah. you know, which can make you feel more, worse about yourself. Right. And, right. Um, and also, uh, as I said, it was a kind of activity that was outside medicine, mm -hmm. <laughs> seeing mm -hmm. the psychiatrist, right? right. Uh, right. All of those um, clinical aspects of their experience. Right. Yeah, I can see that. that, that yeah. and in a supportive group atmosphere, you know, which I right. imagine it was. And I also think, you know, that they read serious texts and they also knew that I was actually, you know, a writer that published my work. Right. Right. Because I had some authority. I wasn't just yeah. someone dragged off the street. Right. Um, and that yeah. helped. Mm -hmm. I love the moment where you're talking about taking over the reins from the previous instructor. Yeah. And you know, she tells you like, oh, I always try to cheer them up, you know. <laughs> so condescending. And, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, um, and well, I'm going to, I'm going to use a vulgarism, but what was really funny was that I sat in on the class and she had given them a poem that was, well, essentially like a Hallmark card poem, you know, all sweet and flowers and happy wappy. And, and one of the patients as he was leaving the room, um, <laughs> walked by her and said, that poem sucked. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and I you remember know. thinking, how right you are. Yes, yes it did. Yes, it did. <laughs> you know, and I think, Gosh. you know, 
having having um, a psychiatric illness doesn't make you unintelligent, right? Insensitive, or you know, unartistic. In fact, um, in the classes, sometimes I would have doctors or staff members sit in, and they would do a a class, you know, write. And I found that their writing was much more often cliched ridden. Interesting. You know, they were the people yeah. writing about sunsets and stuff, you know, in a really cliched way. <laughs> um, and in general, not always, but in general, the patients wrote more exciting material. Yeah, they could access like the raw emotion. That's you right. Know. That's yeah. right. And you know, there, there is a link it's, it's complicated and possibly, uh, you know, up for debate about exactly what's going on, but there has been for now a very long time, a link made, especially between poets and, uh, what used to be called manic depressive illness, which is now called bipolar, uh, illness. Right. It seems to allow a kind of access, uh, which is probably neurological, mm. um, that is not given um, always to so-called normal people. Right, right. Yeah, I wonder if we're losing some of our great poets with the <laughs> advent pharma pharmacological. Yeah, well, listen, you know, the, the, the other thing, it says, Pharmacological treatments have helped a lot of people. Um, if we're talking about depression, um, you know, there was the great Prozac Nation moment. In mm -hmm. fact, SSRIs, um, there's a significant part of the population that does not respond to them. And mm -hmm. actually the response levels have been going down. And really? I suspect, yes, it's because the placebo effect has, wow. has gone down yeah so we have to remember that placebo um is an effect in itself right? right so placebo affects every system of the body um and uh has real physiological effects including releasing endogenous opioids in the brain right so uh -huh. you someone gives you a purple pill and it's a sugar pill Mm -hmm. But you have a, a good relation with that doctor. The relation is very important. Interesting. Isn't that nice? Yeah. 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 <laughs> that if, if, if the doctor throws the pill at you, <laughs> you're going to have a much worse placebo effect than if the doctor sits down, talks with you, and gives you a sugar pill. And here is an even better thing, which is that the doctor can even tell you it's a placebo. This was a study done in, at, at Harvard. The doctor can say, I'm gonna give you this pill. It's, it has sugar in it, but we know that this pill can have genuine physiological effects and it could really make you feel better. And I think you should give it a whirl. And the patients gen you know, generally respond. Right, wow. So, Placebo effect is something else that has to be thought of, first of all, in a relational context. And secondly, you know, why your immune system improves with placebo. Uh, it has effects on the, uh, uh, the cardiac system. I mean, it's just pretty global. Wow. Yeah, that there's a very interesting Italian reset researcher who's written um, many papers, but also a book called placebo named Benedetti and um and you know it's out there yeah it's wow. hard. fascinating uh you talk a lot in the in the essay about modern psychiatry and how it's gotten so much more rigid you know dependent on pharmacological you know uh treatments and other treatments like that verse and which leaves no room or little room for discussion and speculation. And what do you think are the kind of the damaging side effects? Of right. so the thing is psychiatry has been one of those um, sciences uh, or parts of medicine that has been swinging back and forth between what you would call 
a kind of uh, biological model and mm -hmm. um, a more psychological model. Mm. And this has gone on from the very beginning. And of course it's both, <laughs> right? It's both. <laughs> but because actually now decades of uh, neuroscientific studies into the brain have actually not moved psychiatric treatment forward. I mean, there are pharmacological treatments and some of them are good and I'm so glad for them. But in fact, many of those treatments have been discovered by accident. Wow. I mean, there's still, for example, no causal understanding of something like schizophrenia. Right. Um, despite tremendous amounts of brain research that has showed all kinds of, you know, brain changes, yeah. it, ha it hasn't helped um, psychiatry treat these illnesses. Right. right. So I think the pendulum is now swinging back again, which was frankly why I was hired. <laughs> <laughs> I would never have been hired, right? So because I'm interested in narrative, I'm interested in, in uh, you know, writing as a therapeutic and its therapeutic uses. Right. Um, there are many other people now who are working with art therapies of all kinds mm -hmm. that seem to have um, really positive effects, including positive effects on traumatized veterans. Yeah. For example. Right. And um, so it's a growing, it's a growing field. And I just uh, wrote um, a, a kind of a, a paper about well, it's a little complicated, but about how art therapies should be framed in the history of medicine, right? Mm. It's, it's not new. Right, right. right. And there's, there's theater, there's dance, there's visual art, and there's right. writing. And I think all of these um, have a significant role to play. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of that is that every patient has a story, right? Yeah. And, and that I... story cannot be separated from the illness itself. Right, right. right. So every illness is, is dynamic, it's not static. And diagnostic categories can be very static, right? You right. Have, you're, you, you're a schizophrenic you're, or, yeah. you know, or in neurology, you suffer from epilepsy. There are many different manifestations of those illnesses. Right. And they change over time. Right. And they are affected by the lived situation of the person who has the illness. Now, right. I am not suggesting that, that psychiatry <laughs> become like, it's all narrative, right? No. right, right. I'm suggesting no. that along with neuroscientific studies along with pharmacology that there be a kind of return to the importance of the case study. Right, right. Which allows for more nuance and... Yes, and also that the patients are allowed to speak. If you oh. spend as much time reading psychiatric papers as I do, <laughs> you will discover that patients are almost never quoted. Wow. That's crazy. And they need to be quoted. And, right. and that was one of the benefits of older forms of medicine where the doctor would write a long case study often, both in psychiatry, but also in, you know, a heart patient mm -hmm. and, uh, and often quote what the patient had told them. Wow. Now, I think too that one, another benefit of writing is that patients should be able, if they wish, to have their stories published, mm, you know, yeah. as part of um, as part of medical reality, if you yeah. wish. Oh, right. A, there are right. such things. I mean, I have, and I'm a, I'm a great collector of psychiatric memoirs. Yeah from, you know, from the 19th century. My oldest is from the early 19th century. Okay. No, what 18th are, century, I was eight, 18th century. What are some of your favorites? <laughs> well, 
One of my favorites is actually a very famous one um, that Freud wrote about. Now he did not um, meet this patient. It's Dr. Daniel Schraber. Oh. And um, Freud, he wrote a book, a very interesting book about his psychotic experiences. I mean, he was, would be diagnosed as schizophrenic. He had, had very powerful delusions Mm -hmm. And um, one of them was that he was turning into a woman. Now, mm -hmm. if you look at um, his story, which Freud, I don't think, did enough, um, his wife, um, he was a judge. He was mm -hmm. an important man, you know, in, in, yeah. in, in Austria. Anyway, and he, uh, his wife, gave birth to a stillborn baby. Mm. And it was traumatic for her, of course, but I think it was also traumatic for Schreiber. Mm -hmm. Then part of his delusion, part of his fantasy was that he could be fertile, wow. that he could take over the job. This is my reading. This is my personal reading of it. Um, and so there you have an instance of how narrative plays a very important role in the nature of a person's illness. Right. 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 That he, you know, this is just not craziness coming out of nowhere. No, it, no. It, it's craziness coming out of his lived experience. Right. He also had a rather brutal father who was like a child educator and, you know, designed like, um, <laughs> designed these horrible things to tie children into their chairs when they were eating so they, oh, wow. they wouldn't have free movement. Oh, wow. So he was the guinea pig of his father's methods. Gosh. And this, this no doubt also affected the poor man. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, yes, so that's it. I love the Schraber book. It's extremely interesting to read. Wow, that sounds fascinating. Yeah. yeah it is. And how is your, your understanding of, or your understanding that mental illness needs to be looked at, you know, in terms of the whole human being and not separated out? How does that affect your own characters when you're writing fiction? Oh, right. Well, I've, I've long been interested in pathology, right? Sickness um, as a clue to who and what we are, right? Mm -hmm. Just as human beings, um, because it actually can give you a very good glimpse into what we think of, <laughs> you know, as the normal, which uh, right. is, uh, you know, a concept, it's a slippery concept, right? To talk about right. normality. But, and there were times when I was teaching the patients, I thought, so why am I, you know, out in the world and they're in the hospital? Right. What is right. the difference? I mean, I think this is a right. genuine What's the line. Line. What's the line? Um, and I think really what we're talking about is coping mm. with the ordinary routines of daily life. Right. That people land in the hospital when this is no longer possible. Right. For example, most people think of hearing voices as a, as you know, <laughs> like, like you're mad, you're, 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 right. you're crazy if you hear voices. But in fact, there are many people who hear voices and there's a significant portion of the so-called normal population that hears voices um, and is not in the hospital, lives with those voices coming and going. Um, I, for example, have heard voices often on when I'm going to sleep. This is when um, Nabokov, the writer, also heard voices when really? he went to sleep. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, hearing those voices has not sent me to the hospital. <laughs> because, you know, I first of all, I don't worry about them. I don't think that, you know, I, I think I'm that I know I'm hearing voices, so I'm not deluded. Right. And that's a big difference. There are other people who hear music. They're aware of, okay. Yeah. Um, and again, it doesn't seem to perturb their ordinary lives. Right. Um, 
I wish I could remember the title of the book. I can't, but there was um, a man who wrote a book about his father who heard voices his whole working life. I mean, a lot of voices, a lot of the time. Wow. <laughs> he had a job. He took care of his family. And the son goes on a, um, a, a kind of adventure to try to induce voice hearing so that he can understand what it's like. Wow. If you are interested in inducing voice hearing, you can go into one of those um, sensory deprivation tanks, mm. which after a while, many, many people, not everybody, including this poor guy who desperately wanted to hear voices, <laughs> most normal people will begin to have auditory and visual hallucinations after a certain period in the tank. Wow. This is, seems to be related to the fact that when the brain is deprived of stimulation, yeah. it generates its own stimulation, mm -hmm. which may be why dreaming exists. Now this mm -hmm. is, again, I'm, I'm not giving you answers here. I'm giving you speculation. Right. Um, but we know uh, that there are um, illnesses of uh, you know degenerative eye illnesses that affect older people um, mm -hmm. more than younger people, just because like everything else in the body, we we get old and it yep. starts to go bad. Um, so some forms of that uh, will generate just spontaneous hallucinations. Wow, um, including Lilliputian hallucinations. Really? Yes, which are you know like seeing little oh. people. Oh. Little oh. animals, yeah, yeah. Sounds fun. That, <laughs> that can be related to stroke as uh, well. Um, wow. This, I mean, I, I, of course, I'm totally fascinated by this stuff. Yeah. Also, there in temporal lobe epilepsy, and sometimes after stroke, people can be hit with with hypergraphia, which is the need to write. Yeah. Need to write. This has been documented since the 19th century. Oh. Um, and so that obsessive need to write can suddenly appear in a person who has never had that desire before. Wow. That's after, really after some kind of brain incident. Incident, yeah. okay. Wow. Oh. That is fascinating. Actually, this I do remember this. Here's another book if you're interested. It's, yeah. uh, it's Alice Flaherty, F-L-A-H-E-R-T-Y. Um, she herself is a neurologist. Mm -hmm. And her story, which she tells in the book, um, which is a very sad one, she gave birth to twin boys who died. Mm. Okay. And, and after that, she was possessed by an urgent need to write. Wow. And she documents that her own story in, in the book um, in relation to her neurological expertise. It's a very interesting book. Wow. I met, I met her once. We met um, in Boston uh, when I was doing something. Um, and and the, the, the later part of the story, which is a, has a happier turn, is that she gave birth to twin girls oh. who did not die. Wow. And she still had the urge to write. She did. She's... Yeah. So I... it wasn't the loss, it seemed. Right. Right? It was something about birth in her case. Birth. <laughs> That's so uh, interesting. It's really interesting. Yeah. And, that's called, and her book is called The Midnight Disease. The, mi Ooh. the Midnight Disease. Midnight disease disease yeah it's it's a, it's a nice book if, if anyone's interested in and it's you know it's clear it, it's it's lucid it's not bogged yeah. down by by jargon it was written for popular audiences wow i'm just for i'm thinking of the like the early christian mystics oh. as you're you know i love I like marjorie of kemp and Me too. Uh, yeah. Do you, are you interested? So, you in know, I'll tell you my um, first extensive reading 
in neurology was triggered by exactly that. I became really? interested in mystical states, particularly in female saints. Mm. Um, uh, St. Teresa's autobiography sent me into a kind of twirling <laughs> <laughs> happiness. It's a great book. Oh. Um, but also the description of her visions and St. Yeah. Catherine of uh, Siena. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so there are a number of these fascinating cases that yeah. seem to have connections to both epilepsy and migraine. I'm mm -hmm. a migrainer. I have migraines. I have had them since I was a child with auras. So, you know, I've seen oh. strange, <laughs> like all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, so that is absolutely a place where what you can think of as physiological experiences mm -hmm. on, on some level are, of course, cannot be reduced to that. Right. They're part of the lived experience of, of the saints. Right. And how that experience is contextualized in the particular culture that they're living in. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. And like, yeah, living in a culture where women do not have voices too. And that's right. And they, so a, a place where the church was actually one of the few domains in the culture for women to have power. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, I mean, St. Teresa got quite a bit of power. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, so these are all interesting things um there's also hildegard of bingen yes i love her in the mm -hmm. so hildegard of bingen um now saint hildegard of mm -hmm. bingen um was uh writing she was a nun writing in the 1100s this is a mm -hmm. long time ago she wrote music she wrote about medicine about cures um mm -hmm. and she was utterly utterly brilliant yeah. a human being. And she also had visions that have been connected to migraine. Really? I didn't yes. know. Yes. Um, in fact, I think Oliver Sacks mentions Hildegard of Bingen in his book on migraine, which is a very, very good book. I think it's his, his best book. That really? Awakenings. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's awake Awakenings? No, I think the Hildegard yep. of Bingen material is in um, is in the migraine book. Okay. But he may have he may have talked about her elsewhere too, but I can't I can't place it. Okay. Interesting. Well, yeah. this is so fascinating. I have more questions, but I think I should let. Oh, yes. Right. Okay. Right. I Other could go on. We're having a good time. <laughs> I know. Um, right. Yes, well, open I'd it like up? to be the first okay. questions. Yeah. Um, number one, it was so fascinating and you were filled with so much information that um, I saw you writing it down. I know. I didn't Taking have a notes. Taking notes. <laughs> so much that you gave to us. Uh, I just have one question that um, I wanted to ask you. In this class that you were running, you took some of the papers. Did they want to share it with friends and family? Or is there, some, because in my creative writing, there are people who would write and we could share with each other, but I don't think that they would like others who know them. Absolutely. And so one of the things we, I did when I was there is that for the, for the patients who wanted to have the work like put together in a little, you know, not published exactly, but put together for other people in the, in the you know, on the psychiatric ward to read and look at, they could give their stuff and we would compile it. But there were people who did not want, they did not want their writing to leave the room. They were very, you know, held onto it. And I always said, and there were also, <laughs> there are also patients who said to me, you're not gonna show it to my psychiatrist, are you? And I would always say, no, no. There was only one time when I felt that there was a, that one of the patients was in danger of, of hurting him himself or somebody else that I went to the authorities. Right. He threatened to, he, I mean, you can't possibly know who it is. He threatened to kill his family and then kill himself. Oof. Now, a threat like that might 
not be a genuine threat. You know, it might have been something to put me on guard, to show up. I mean, it's impossible to know. But that was the only time I felt I had a responsibility to tell, um, you know, to tell. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, we we really kept it inside, and and the, and the patients were free to either give it to me if they wanted to put it into the collection of, of texts, you know, at the end of the year, um, or take it home with them. Mm -hmm. It was all very open. Thanks. That's thank you for, for answering. I, I was just wondering how they felt about sharing. That's it with right. the people, if they were it, it was it, okay for some of them it was okay in the room. You know, I have to say this is a class, you know, where weeping was tolerated, for example. So if people wept, it was fine. Uh, we did some laughing too. Um, but you know, it was.